my spiritual son, and uh, he's, he's lit up like a Christmas tree, and he's on fire like most of the, the forest fires around here, and God has bestowed him with some real great revelation, and uh, it's really neat to have Tom uh, coming up alongside and, of me. Uh, without any further ado, come on, Tom, come on up here. Yes, hallelujah. He's got a word of the Lord for us this morning that, that's going to spark us up, and uh, hopefully you guys can hang with us. This is going to be on YouTube, so uh, be ready for it. Okay. Hugs, loves. Thank you. Woo. I'm praying for the sticky note annoying. The teacher in me just. Okay, everybody just went to sleep, right? No, we're gonna, we're gonna, go, we're gonna go through it. So, you know what? Let's uh, let's pray. Before, before we embark on uh, what I think is pretty special. I'm excited about it, uh, about what the Lord has kind of put on my heart. So we're just going to get into his presence. <clears throat> Lord, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for your mercies and your grace that are new all the time, Father. We thank you for the love that is bestowed on us, Father. We thank you. For every day, whether we hear it or not, you speak our identity to us. And we thank you that we're sons and daughters, Father. We thank you, Lord. Father, like the last song that we sang today, I go where you go. I say what you say. I pray what you pray. Lord, I would ask that every hindrance that would stand in the way ultimately from what you have to share with this body, that it would be destroyed and removed, including, Father, everything in me. All I desire is for the people to hear your word from your heart. And I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When I was down in Arizona, really cool thing happened, and I'm starting to just kind of share this more and more, and and I want to share this with my family. I think whenever we're in the presence of God, we have to be in an attitude of expectation. Amen. That's right. Expectation. Anybody have a hard time this week? I did. I had a hard time this week. I came back from Arizona fired up. Randy DeMaine, Patricia King, Todd White, Mark Sharona, Robert Slairdon. Fed with a fire hose, baby. (laughs) I was fired up. I'm excited. The Lord spoke to me, shared things about me. To me, for me. It's fired up. Amen. Gave me this word. I was excited. And then this week, life. Yeah. 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 You know, nothing terrible. Life. Yeah, this, that. Great friend of mine. Relationship. Not bad. Just. Uh, uh, uh. I'm laying in bed one night. Nicole says, my wife, my beautiful wife, she says, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. I'm just, I mean, I went from Mount Everest to Grand Canyon. It was like, like, what is going on? What is going on? Lord, maybe I didn't hear you. Maybe it's just me. Lord, did I miss it. And he said you didn't. It was a distraction designed to get you off what I've called you to do. So I'm more excited today. And I'll tell you why I got even more excited last night. I knew that I was on to (laughs) something. Because last night, as I'm typing this all out, got sniffles. 
throat. A little bubble guts. Yeah. I said, no. <laughs> no. I said, Lord, we're not having this. We're all done. So here's what I'm telling you. If you had a hard week and you made it here, expect. Because he has something for you. Expect. Well, <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my teacher mode thing. I'm going to go into my teacher mode. I got lots of notes because I'm like, if not, sometimes I get spiritual ADD. And I just start like bouncing all over the place. So, so um, anything that uh, I miss or mess up, I'm sure that the grace of God will cover that. And you'll get exactly what you're supposed to get out of it. So um, the title of this message, and I'm going to give you a little bit of the history, uh, how I got it, so it, it makes some sense to you because I think that it's really important and critical for this time. Um, the presence of this message, and it's actually a series. So um, my, father, my spiritual dad and my heavenly dad have uh, blessed me, and they said, hey, you got the next couple of weeks to kind of get this into the body. <clears throat> so this series is actually called Presence Positions You for Power. Presence Positions You for Power. Creation is crying out for the sons of God to be revealed in the earth. The word says it. And, and I didn't give this to Miss Patty back there, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Glory will be revealed in us. So the things that we have to wade through in this life, thank you so much, <clears throat> right now are small compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Anybody in here sons of God? Amen. Yeah. Creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Our reality is that as sons, we must carry, and daughters, Girls too. Yay, girls. <clears throat> we must carry the very DNA of the kingdom itself. Come on. That's good. Let that sink in for a moment. As sons and daughters, we must carry the very DNA of the kingdom itself. Creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. We have to have dad's DNA. We have to. Put another way. We must do the very works of Christ and greater works. Amen. That's right. But we can only do that if we follow the example of Jesus. As our Lord and Savior, as the perfect one, he has given us the template to follow. The simple truth is that Jesus, our example, walked in and operated with unlimited power and authority because, and, and the Lord gave this to me a long time ago, and, and I've said it to this body before, and I'm going to say it again to my family. The cool thing about Jesus, when he walked on the earth, Jesus was never calling heaven down. He was letting heaven out. That's what he did all the time. Let heaven out. He was never, oh, can I get some? It was in him all the time. Why? Because he remained in constant fellowship and in the presence of the Father all the time. Amen. That's right. Jesus was always in the presence of God. Always. The last song that we sang, I'm like, wow, imagine. Jesus only said what he heard the Father say. How did he know? <laughs> he was constantly with him. He only did what he saw the Father do. How did he know? He was constantly with him. He only moved when the Spirit led him. How did he know? 
He was constantly with them. So as sons and daughters, it is critical that we start to get into a place where the presence of God is constantly a part of our life. Not just Sunday. That's right. Come on. That'll preach. Hello. <laughs> I'm talking to me. <laughs> talking to me. Okay? <clears throat> so, Jesus walked and operated in unlimited power and authority because he was constantly connected or in the full presence of the Father. A difficulty that many of us have is that we want, this is what Pastor Mike would call one of those refrigerator magnets, <clears throat> we want the power and authority of sonship without going through the process. God is a God of process. Miss Patty, would you bring up Galatians 4, 1 and 2? So if you have your swords with you, go to Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now I say as long as, <clears throat> as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. As sons, we're over it all. But in infancy, we have to be placed under authority until when? But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. There's a process. There's a time when the Father says, you're released into the fullness of everything that I have for you. So a lot of us want the power and authority. Lord, we want more of your fire. We want more of your glory. We want more. We want more. We want more. We want more. But I don't want to spend any time. Come on. That's right. I had to wait 20 years. <laughs> I don't want to spend any time. No, oh, give me all the good stuff. I want the crown but I don't want the cross. That's right. Come on. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Presence positions you for power. Yes. As I meditated on this one this week, the Lord showed me in, in meditation, he said that Jesus was completely surrendered to the Father. And I'm going to list a couple areas, and, and I'm going to explain where they all come from. So submission and sacrifice. Miss Patty, would you bring up Luke 2242? So if you've got your Bibles, you can flip over to Luke 2242. Saying, Father, if you are willing... Remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus was constantly in surrender and sacrifice to the Father. Submission. He said, yeah, I'd like to have it this way, but ultimately my agenda is unimportant. What is your agenda? John 5.30. So flip over to John chapter 5. Verse 30, Jesus say, is saying, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Why? Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of he who sent me. I'm going to put aside everything that's me. What do you want, God? I'm in sacrifice and submission to you. And we'll look at one more in John. John 10, 17. For this reason, the Father loves me. Why does he love me? Because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. Jesus is saying, I'm in complete and total submission and sacrifice to what the Father wants to do. The next area he showed me was that Jesus was in complete intimacy with the Father all the time. Complete intimacy. Luke 
chapter 6. Let's flip over to Luke real quick. We're going to come back to John, so stick your finger there. Luke 6.12. So you, you didn't know. You were actually going to get some practice flipping through the Bible. Right? See, that's good stuff right there. Right? <clears throat> 6, chapter 12. So my, my Bible says at the, at, the, at the head of that, before the 12th verse, it says choosing the 12. So before Jesus went and chose the 12, he did something very specific. What did he do? It was at this time that he went to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. The whole night. He says, Dad, I'm going to get with you. Because guess what? We're about to do something. You and I, we're going to partner together. We're going to do something that's going to change the world forever. I've got to hear you. I've got to hear you. Not a minute. Not an hour, the whole night. That's good. Remember, for those of us that are married or have that long-term significant other, if you remember the beginning, you could sit all night. That's right. All night. I think Jesus is inviting us to fall in love again. Will you sit with me all night? Will you be intimate with me? Will you know me? Will you let me put my arms around you? Will you sit in my lap? Will you snuggle up with me? Jesus did. John eleven forty two. So we kick back over to John. Eleven forty two. And this is at the tomb of Lazarus, and, and, and we know this story. You know, Jesus shows up. Lazarus has been dead for three days, and he tells him in 41, he says, roll away the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. But then he goes on, and the next verse is what I thought was very important and interesting. Jesus says this. He says, I knew you've always, you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that they believed that you sent me. How did Jesus know that the Father always heard him? Because he never left him. He never left him. Dad, you want to raise Lazarus? You do? Awesome. I'm going to go down there and do it. And I'm going to do it. And I'm going to thank you for it. Not because of us. But because they need to know That's right. that you and I are always together. And he showed me that Jesus was always sold out and surrendered in obedience. So we just flip back a couple sections to John 6, verse 38. Again, Jesus is saying, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I'm obedient. I'm obedient. I got no agenda. I'm doing what I was sent to do. And then the last one, he said that Jesus understood his sonship and identity. John chapter 17. And I'm just going to do 17.1, Miss Patty. John 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. So as I meditated on this, the Lord said, Jesus operated in uninterrupted power because he was always in my presence. And he understood my presence in the realm of submission and sacrifice, intimacy, obedience, and sonship. Refrigerator magnet. 
Learning to master the art of his presence is critical to carry his power. Learning to master the art of his presence is critical to carry his power. In his presence, we not only learn to hear and obey his voice, but we learn to hear and protect his heart. When I'm in his presence, I not only learn to hear and obey his voice, but I learn what his heart sounds like. I fall in love with him, and I want to protect his heart. Think about this. <clears throat> Teenagers. I got lovely, lovely teen girls, you know. And, and those of us that have raised teen girls or, those, or, or boys, and those of us that are raising, one of the most difficult times is as our children are fighting for independence, letting them go, and we want to control everything. But why do we want to control everything? Nope. Keep us safe. Nope. We're not trying to keep them safe. We're trying to keep us safe. Don't you do anything to embarrass me. Right? Think about it. Most of the stuff that, yeah, yeah, we want to keep them safe. I'm not saying we go, ah, go play in traffic. That's on you. That's not, you know, because they're going to go, what dumb parents that person had. You know what I mean? It's going to look bad for us, right? So we're concerned about our heart. Somebody said, I heard somebody said, the difficulty about having children is that you actually watch your heart walk around outside your body. That's a difficult thing with children. But think about this. If you knew that you knew that you knew that your children would always protect your heart, you don't control them. You just love them. You just love them. Go. Mastering the art of his presence is critical for us carrying his power because we learn not only to obey his voice, we learn to hear and protect his heart. And God know, see, God knew that Jesus knew his heart. He had no problems going, son, do it. Do it. Jesus was up there. God was up there. Jesus would do something. God was going, yeah, baby, that's my boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? This is my son in whom I am what? Well, well pleased. That's right. That's right. What did he say? Jesus has got my heart. When we're in his presence, we learn not only to hear and obey his voice, we learn to hear and protect his heart. When I was in Arizona... <clears throat> Yay to my new friends from Arizona. Yay. So a April and Cindy, um, you know, it's cool how God just does things. I'm, I'm, you know, doing security, and, you know, you descend on Arizona. I'm like, I knew Rodney, right? So me and Rodney were together. Whoa, right? So <clears throat> I got to get you guys ready because Rodney will be here in a month. Whoa. You know, so he's all fired up. So I descend on Arizona, <clears throat> and I like, I knew Rodney. I was the only person. And then I saw a lady that I thought I knew from here. And one day I go, where are you from? And she goes, Redmond, Oregon. Yeah. You too? Yeah, yeah, that's Terry, right? Yeah, Terry, you know, I looked at her and she, she gives me one. Yeah. I'm like, and then she was with all these lovely ladies. So it's actually kind of cool. Mark Sharona said this, and this is my new favorite saying. He says, chance, it's for you guys. Chance is the pseudonym that God uses when he doesn't want to be identified. There are no coinky dinks in the kingdom. That's right. Amen. Right? Okay. So to my new friends there. So when I was in Arizona, one of the speakers uh, one day gets up, and uh, Todd White, awesome, man. This dude is just like on fire. And he gets up, and, and he's ministering, and he makes this statement, and, and the statement just kind of hit me, and I was kind of, I was doing the Rodney. I was like, whoa. He says, 
the next generation of Christian in the earth is going to be a generation that we've never seen before. And he said the generation of Christian coming up on the earth is a generation that move in a fear of the Lord. Here's what scared me about that whole thing. He said, we've never seen it before. Right after he says that, the Lord drops this one on me. Presence positions you for power. Cool. So I wrote it down. I didn't know what that meant. A couple days later, the Lord gave me this. Presence at the altar. So I'm going to give you a snapshot in the next couple weeks. Presence at the altar. Presence in the secret place. Presence in the wilderness. Presence at the table. I'm like, cool. I'm in the shower when I get back home because he didn't really give me much more than that. He just said, write this down. So I write it down. <laughs> That's a refrigerator magnet. When the Lord tells you to write something down, write it down. <laughs> so I wrote it down. I get home, I'm in the shower. The Lord talks to me a lot in the shower. So I'm in the shower, and I'm like, wow, Lord, presence at the altar, presence in the secret place, presence at the table, presence in the wilderness. Oh, that's so cool. I know you got something. What is this all about? He goes, ready? In the shower. I'm like, yep. (laughs) Presence at the altar is about sacrifice and submission. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to get there. Trust me. Presence at the altar is about sacrifice and submission. Presence in the secret place is about developing intimacy. Presence in the wilderness is about developing obedience and trust. Presence at the table is about identity and sonship. Where we're going over the next four weeks is learning how to practice the presence. It's interesting that we're starting a series in January called Hosting the Presence. There are no coinky dinks in the kingdom. That's right, man. That's right. My beautiful wife gave this to me a couple days ago. She goes, uh, Elijah List. Anybody hip to Elijah List? Okay. She forwards this to me a couple days ago. She goes, you got to read the Elijah List. And I'm like, sweet. What is that? (laughs) It's in your inbox. Awesome. So I go get it. So uh, I think his name's Greg or Doug Addison. Um, yeah. oh, so he says for 1120. So we're talking in two days. Right. Expect. That's right. Expect. Expect to see greater release of God's power, presence, Revelation and healing. Yeah, God's talking. God's talking. Good Expect greater revelation of his presence, power, revelation, and healing. So, <clears throat> today we're going to look at the altar. We're going to look at the altar. Quick picture. Lord shows me pictures. Quick picture, the garden, perfect, works, the lions lay down with the lambs, snakes roll around, everybody's happy, it's working, Adam and Eve in perfect fellowship, they walk with God in the cool of the day, beautiful, sin enters. What is the first thing that happens after sin enters the garden? They hide from the presence. Promises. But even more, God's perfect plan to restore us back to a level where his presence with us was uninterrupted. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. This is God's blueprint 
for restoration back to the table as sons and daughters. The first thing that God does in the garden, he says, come and eat. All these trees, you can eat. The last verse in Revelation, what does he say? Come and drink. From Genesis to Revelation, the Lord is setting a table for us because we're sons and daughters. And here's his plan to bring us back to the table. Amen. You should be fired up. Pastor, I think we're going to go into some ministry time and raise the dead. There you go. Oh, okay. So, all right. So, so what is what is the altar? So, what is the altar? Um, as I went through, I thought this was really pretty cool. So, I'm going to geek out for a minute. So, the altar is mentioned 324 times in the Bible. 324 times. I go, that's pretty significant. The altar is mentioned that many times in the Bible. If we look at Old Testament, we have some different meanings. In the Old Testament, typically the word altar was high place or place of slaughter. Guys, it's going to be messy at the altar. (laughs) It's going to be messy at the altar. In the New Testament, the meaning has become a place of sacrifice. Altars were constructed of stone and wood. It was a place where sacrifices were laid. Now, I'm not saying that we need to go back to the law, okay, because I'm not under the law. I'm under what? Grace. Grace. I'm not under the law. Amen. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. So I'm not talking about going back to the Old Testament, but there is still an altar that we need to be aware of, and we need to spend time on it, and it's an altar of flesh, the altar of our heart, the altar of our heart. So, with regards to the presence of the Lord, there are a few things that happen at the altar. So, if you're taking notes, there are three things I want to cover. I think the Lord's going to bring us in just great. One, at the altar, we acknowledge God's provision and we honor him. At the altar, we acknowledge God's provision and we honor him. Two, at the altar... We sacrifice. Three, and this one, man. We worship. I was talking to a friend this week. Ever since I got back from Arizona, this has been my cry. This is my heart. Lord, get all the crap that is me out of the way so there is no interruption of your flow in my life. Does everybody, real quick, does everybody understand the difference between thanksgiving, praise, and worship? In thanksgiving, in thanksgiving, we recognize God's goodness. In praise, we recognize God's greatness. In worship, we recognize his holiness. Presence starts with us recognizing, as he told Moses, take off your shoes for this place it's holy ground. That's, right. That's what the altar is all about. So if we look at the first one. So number one, at the altar, we acknowledge God's provision and we honor God. So let's turn in your Bibles to Genesis 8, 20, and 21. So Miss Patty, if you would, Genesis 8, 20, and 21. Then Noah built an ark. So, um, so everybody knows the story. So this is, this is after the flood subsides. Noah and his family are in the ark. 19 says, he, every beast, every creeping thing 
and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out and their families left the ark, then what did Noah do? Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal of every, and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings in the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing, the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. What was Noah doing building the altar? He's saying, Lord, I acknowledge that you spared me. You saw significance in my life and I never want to forget you. He built an altar and he sacrificed. Genesis 12, verses 7 and 8. And we know this guy, this is Abram. If we start at verse 6, Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah, and then the Canaanite was, and now the Canaanite was, in, uh, was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he, who? Abram. What did he do? He built an altar to him who had appeared before him, then he proceeded from there to the mountains east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent there. Later on, he comes back to that altar, and when he comes back to the altar, he calls on the Lord. So we see, looking at some of the patriarchs of faith, when they had an encounter with God, his provision showed up. They honored him by erecting an altar. Refrigerator magnet. Only at the altar do I give up my need for self-sufficiency and realize that God is all in all. Noah and Abraham, building an altar, said, we know it's only because of you. Two, at the altar, we sacrifice. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole scripture reference, but I'm going to give it to you here for you to study because I believe that there are some things that we need to study. It is the honor of God to conceal a matter. It is the honor of kings to search out a matter. So this is for you to read. So Genesis 22, verses 1 through 12 and, and most of us know that story. This is the story of Abraham and Isaac. Isaac is now the son of promise. He's grown up. What does the Lord call him to do? Sacrifice him. Sacrifice him. What is God asking Abraham in sacrificing Isaac? Are you going to rely on the thing that I promised you or you will Will you rely on the one who promised? Will you rely on the thing that I promised you? Or you, will you rely on the one who promised? 20 years. Mike and Patty, given the vision of Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. 20 years. Lord, God, a year ago you gave me this vision and you haven't come through. What in the world is going on? Maybe you're not faithful. (laughs) Maybe you're not faithful. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Maybe you're not faithful. (laughs) So, right? So, you know, five years. You know, I was there. I was, the, you know, seven years. The Lord said this was going to be your home. Seven years I waited. Man, I will bless you with a seed, and through that seed, I will bless all the families of the earth and make you a great nation. Oh, here he is. Thank you, Lord. Awesome. Abraham, yes, sir. Here I am, because that's what they say. You're supposed to say that. Mark that down. When the Lord calls you, you're supposed to say, here I am, right? Here I am. Hey, Abraham, what's up? Isaac, got him, my boy, love him. Kill him. 
Hmm. Hmm. Here's something about Abraham. I'm going to deviate just for a minute. Here's something e- e- uh, interesting about Abraham. It says that Abraham obeyed the laws, commandments, and ordinances of the Lord, and his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. Here's the cool thing. Abraham never had the commandments, ordinance, and of the Lord. That's right. That's right. He trusted the one who promised. Amen. Dad, where is the sacrifice? The Lord will provide. A holy God requires sacrifice. The first act of sacrifice in the Bible was by God's hand. Adam and Eve sinned. They hid themselves. They sewed together fig leaves. What did God do? He killed an animal and made clothing for them out of skin. He says, we have to fix this problem and sacrifice is required. Refrigerator magnet. The enemy of true worship, holiness, is self-centeredness. Self-centeredness dies at the altar. Luke 9, 22 and 23 is everybody's bums holding up? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. You know what? I'm expecting the Lord to do something today. I'm not leaving until he does. I'm going to show up. I hope all of you join me. If you got a bug out, I got it. But we're going to get there. So Luke 9, 23. And he was saying to them, them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, follow me, do what I do, what must he do? Deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake is he who will Save it. At the altar, we sacrifice and we give our lives. Once? Nope. Daily. Daily. Jesus, when the Lord, when I was meditating on this, the Lord said, Jesus, moment to moment, sacrificed his own will. Can you imagine? I think that Jesus a lot of time walked around and he did this. This is what was happening. Father was leading him. He's like, I'm not moving until you tell me to move. Daily. So sacrifice. And then three, what happens at the altar? We worship. We recognize the holiness of God through honor and sacrifice, and this leads us to worship. This is our service. Romans 12, 1 and 2. All right. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to what? Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of what? Worship. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Jesus says in Luke, take up your cross daily. What is the cross? Death. Die. Every day. 
And the apostle comes back and he says, daily what? Present yourselves a living sacrifice. Die. This is your service of worship. And through that, we're not condemned to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. That word prove, prove. And here's what Jesus did. From my law training, the word prove, when we see the word prove in law, prove means to make obvious to those outside. That's what prove means. So when we prove what is the acceptable will of God, what do we do? We make it obvious to those outside. How do I do that? I die. I get out of the way. It's the only way I can do it. Because if my mind is involved, if I'm involved, I'm going to mess it up. I die. I get out of the way. Then I can prove that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. The altar. The presence at the altar is about our sacrifice. One of the ways that the Lord kind of works with me, and he says, I want you to, I heard this at the gym one day. I was kind of in by myself and had the radio on, and the song came on, and I played it yesterday, and I, I promised my wife right now I won't be a baby and blubber, but um, we're going to play this song. The Lord wants to impart or minister a heart of sacrifice. That's scary, I know. But here's where it gets gooder. Presence positions you for power. Creation is anxiously longing for the sons of God to be revealed. Jesus said, the works I do, you'll do. And greater works. Because he's sitting at dad's side going, go Mike. But he needs to see dead people. Dead people. Father loved Jesus. So if I'm alive, God sees me. I don't want him to see me. I want him to see Jesus. Because if he sees Jesus, he pours out his power. And then I get to participate. I go, man, this is cool. The Lord wants to give you his power. It comes at a cost. And it's not terrible. He's simply asking, will you stay in my presence?